yeah, the idea is not that uh, <clears throat> you have some sort of perfectly uh, powerless person at the bottom ranks of society who uh, <clears throat> is, you know, sort of organically, sort of uniquely organically inspired to create p political change and labors for that change. And then along comes somebody with education and money and influence and sort of hijacks what that person has done. The point is, is that um, the institutions that make up elite American society, right, have particular ways of confronting, confronting social problems, uh, <clears throat> some of which can be genuinely useful, but most of which are bent towards sort of maintaining a particular sort of uh, status quo approach to just the way that things work, right? Uh, so uh, if you are, you know... <clears throat> uh, uh, Bank of America, and you have a a a float at Pride every uh, <clears throat> year, right? Um, I I think people won't misunderstand my sort of critique of that. It's not that the people involved with doing that at Pride aren't actually interested in uh, gay rights, right? That they don't have organic sort of emotional and political motivation to help gay people, LGBTQ people. The critique is that, right, like um, Bank of America must approach sort of LGBTQ issues from that perspective of let's have a parade and honor these people. Let's fly flags outside of our offices to let them know that they're welcome here rather than, for example, the vision of queer liberation that many people in the LGBTQ activist space have talked about for a long time, right? In other words, that it is bank, in Bank of America's best interest to conceive of gay politics as a, a, sort of an abstraction about, you know, respect and love and equality, rather than um, as a matter of, you know, dramatically changing the power distribution of the United States, which, of course, would would be uh, inimical to the interests of the sort of stakeholders within Bank of America. And again, like this is not about sincerity, right? E absolutely everyone in an elite institution can be completely sincere about their desires to help people who are trying to create bottom-up change, but that their conception of how we go about doing that is always going to be bent by their own best interests. So, uh, John Schwartz, um, when he was writing for Tiny Revolution, this is from like the Bush era, this is from a long time ago, but he came up with this idea of the iron law of institutions, which is that if you have people within an institution, they're always going to uh, do what is best for their position within the institution rather than what is best for the institution itself. So, for example, you could think of a, a, a vice president at a company who heads up his own division and his research indicates to him that his division is in fact redundant and that you could dissolve the, the division and sort of distribute its responsibilities to other parts of the company, save the company a lot of money without uh, uh, any loss of function. Um, and Schwartz's point is that like people don't do that, right? They, they, they don't uh, sort of do things that uh, hurt their own place within an institution in an effort to protect the institution. And that's true in a broad sense of, uh, of sort of like, if we want to think of like an institution as being like a movement for racial or social justice, um, it's not that people don't sincerely care about achieving that kind of racial or social justice. It's that by dint of their perspective on the world, they're not going to sincerely, sin uh, sincerely confront the possibility that, um, uh, something that actually hurts their their place within this sort of movement is something that's going to be good for the movement. So like Black Lives Matter, for example, various organizations within the Black Lives Matter umbrella have now been revealed to be sort of subject to systemic corruption. I think this was quietly one of the um, <clears throat> more significant moments of the past few years, got much less fa fanfare than all the sort of the protesting and the, you know, um, but I think many, many people were just quietly disillusioned to learn that, you know, many billions of dollars are missing, right? And that hundred, we know of hundreds of millions of dollars that were likely d diverted inappropriately. Um, <clears throat> you know, those people might, uh, might be able to say, you know what, you're right. We should never have existed in the form that we did. We're going to dissolve our organization and we're going to redistribute the money elsewhere. But people don't do that. And broadly speaking, that's what happened. It's not, it's not a question of sort of like, 
um, of a perfectly pure person at the bottom who is sort of, you know, who is possessed of perfect virtue, who wants change, and then the wicked people at the top. The point is, is that as you move up the power spectrum, right, you start to encounter the needs of people at the top. You start to encounter the needs of uh, <clears throat> of institutions, um, and those necessarily divert energy in, in a, unproductive ways.